Bet Online remains your number one source for all your sports betting this season. Everything from NFL playoffs to pro and college basketball, UFC, MMA, and more. You'll always find the latest odds, team matchup info, player news, and game trends at Bet Online. With live betting options, free contests, and live scores for almost any sport or game imaginable. Bet Online is truly the fastest and easiest way to bet all your favorite leagues and events. Head to betonline.ag today or use your mobile device to join and receive your 50% welcome bonus with your first deposit. Make sure to use promo code BELIEVE to receive your rewards. Betonline.ag, where the game starts. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Believe in OK State podcast. I am Megan Robinson, joined as always by Eve Batoba and Justin Southwell. Guys, we really did have a slow week this week. Nice to have no chaos. You know what that was like. <laughs> yeah, just kind of. I mean, the, the big news from last week, or since our last episode came out, was that it was National Signing Day. Although That's I right. feel like National Signing Day is not what it used to be in the sense that there's the transfer portal, which makes waves. There's the you know the early signing period. I remember you know. 10 years ago when you guys were in school or entering school, it was like the big deal. Like who, where's Jadavion? Cl- That's the one that sticks out to me. That's Jadavion Clowney. <laughs> where is he going to go? And it was like this huge deal being broadcast live on ESPN. And I honestly didn't turn on sports center that day, but it just feels like it's a little bit less exciting with all these other times to sign. Yeah. There are a lot of things on the calendar that kind of, you know, take, the headway. The most exciting thing about signing day is that fax machines actually get some use now. Um, again, right? That's the only day that you remember that fax machines actually exist. But outside of that, you just, uh, it, it's almost anticlimactic. You have the transfer portal, you have all these other things in the calendar that are taking place, and we have access to so many more, so much more news um, across the country. So it's always interesting. Um, on signing day, I always like to just remind some athletes specifically if there are any athletes that actually do watch our program it's you know every athlete wants an offer but not every athlete actually wants waits at six o'clock in the morning and then going to class eight to twelve and then having one p.m meetings and then a two p.m practice and then four p.m film study and then uh, six p.m mandatory study hall over my time at Oklahoma State, the four and a half years that I was there, I saw a lot of athletes come and a lot of athletes go, okay? And not everybody can handle that. Not everybody comes in mentally prepared. So I would hope that the entire class of 2023 that is entering Oklahoma State would come in with the right mindset to take care of what needs to be taken care of so that you can get on that field uh, the right way. Um, if there's if there's one thing I know about Coach Gundy is that Coach Gundy is not a BS kind of guy. You mess up on the field, he is not uh, he, he he's not qu- like he he can be quick to actually like say, hey, you don't belong here. It's, it's time for you to go. So take care of what you need to take care of in the classroom, off the field, on the field, and uh, you'll be all right. Doesn't anything to add to signing? No, there? well said, Eve. <laughs> actually. Signing day used to totally annoy me. Uh, I just remember thinking, like, it is not that big of a deal. <laughs> but, I mean, it is. Like, whenever I see it from the other side and and I do realize, like, hey, you know, you're committing to a place for your next three, four, five years unless you enter the transfer portal now. But it is a big deal for these kids. So yeah, I look at it a little bit more with uh, a different perspective. But at the same time, this year especially – I was just happy for it all to be over. So Yeah. And, and I will say it's just some things to be mindful of because I remember Coach Gundy used to always harp on these specific things, uh, whether we were going into winter break, if we're going to summer break or any type of extended break. He would always say, make sure that you're staying respectful to the women. Right. And be careful. Uh, number two, stay away from any type of violence. People that you are uh, maybe that you grew up with who may not have anything to lose. You have more to lose than them. So stay away from guns. Stay away from all types of violence. Alcohol. Right. If you can stay away from alcohol, please just watch it and then take care of your your schoolwork. Right. That was the fourth thing. And he would always emphasize, hey, a lot of y'all are going to drive four hours away to Dallas. You're going to drive eight hours to Houston. 
make sure that you just go the speed limit. Is it really worth getting there 20 minutes early if you're going to get in some type of accident or if you're going to get a speeding ticket? So just stay the speed limit, get home safe, and then we can bring everybody back safe and sound. Um, just a piece of advice, something that always stuck with me. And, and the reason why it sticks with me is because one of our uh, safeties, Johnny Thomas, he summarized it with like the four B's, right? It was uh, broads, bullets, booze, and books. He was like, those were the four B's. Just, just make sure you stay clear of those and you'll, you're going to be all right. So, uh, yeah, everybody, pay attention to the four B's and you're going to be good. Got to get Eve to come speak at the, you know, it's not a rookie symposium, but you know, the, the freshman, the freshman orientation. Yeah. <laughs> You'd be like, yeah. listen, guys, this is how you survive college. But no, it's good advice for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. And you, and you, and you know, one thing, sorry, I feel like I'm talking a lot, but I do have to <laughs> emphasize on this point. There's over my tenure at Oklahoma state, I think I had three teammates that were four star recruits. Right. There was Des Bryant and everybody knows Des Bryant and what he ended up doing. And then there were two other guys whose names I'm not going to mention because they came in with all these stars next to their names and they didn't actually pan out to do anything. They don't have any significant playing time that's actually worth remembering. And that just goes to show like these stars that you come in with, honestly, they don't matter as much as you think. There are so many guys that are in the NFL right now who are two star recruits, who are three star recruits, who are zero star recruits. And you've seen it happen at Oklahoma State time and time again. Guys who, you know, came out of nowhere, popped and then made it to the league. So, hey, stay the course, buy into the program, make sure that you pay attention to Coach Glass and everybody else within strength and conditioning and you're going to be all right. I mean, you look at someone like Malcolm Rodriguez, and I don't know how many stars he had off the top of my head. Um, but I say that like he was a six round draft pick by the Lions, worked his ass off in camp and worked his way into a starting spot. Granted, that's yeah. the NFL, but the same thing can happen in college. You can come in being a highly touted four or five star recruit. But if th three star guys working harder than you and playing better and putting in that extra work, I mean, the great players, you know, I've. I've interviewed, I've, I've spoken to some basketball players recently, and when they're not at practice, guess what they're doing? They're practicing. Oh, yeah, that's right. They're putting shots up. They're in the gym by themselves working hard. Same thing with football players. The great players are not the ones who are doing the minimum. They're the ones who eat, sleep, and breathe their sport. So. Yeah. Yeah. J Justin, you remember our teammate, uh, number 22, Big Game James? Big game, James. How can We've you forget? talked about him before. Yeah, yeah. he's been so mentioned on the pod. I remember going into his final year. We always talk about how he always seemed to be at the right place at the right time. Always had that game-changing momentum swinging play or game ceiling play. That interception, that fumble, all that. Mm -hmm. And I just remember whenever he was walking to class. This was leading into that season. He would walk to class and he was he would like stare at his phone and he would be sitting down at a bench looking at his phone. And then one day I just went over. I'm like, man, what are you looking at? And he was just watching film. That's what he would always do was just watch film like he's studying the opponents. He is studying himself. He is watching film and trying to predict the future. The better that you can become at predicting the future, the more success that you're actually going to have at the next level of college football. So one of the best things that you can do as you transition from high school to college is not just rely on your raw athletic ability, not just that talent, but man, whenever you can get really, really good at figuring out opponents tendencies, maybe we know that this certain coach likes you run this kind of scheme or they like to blitz from this side. Those are the different. That's the difference maker right there. The smartest teammate that I ever had, especially on the defensive end, was Markel Martin. Right. He was a safety number 10 for Oklahoma State. We all know and love Markel Martin. I still think Markel someday is going to become the defensive coordinator at Oklahoma State. OK, but Markel Martin was a guy who as soon as the huddle broke on the offensive side, he knew exactly what play was coming. And he would tell everybody. I remember there was one game where he had what? Well, Three dropped picks, okay? You know, because you know, he's still a DB at the end of the day, you know, he ain't had the right hands, but he always knew where the ball was going to be, and that is how you distinct yourself from everybody else. There's also a guy on The Bachelor named Mark Hell Martin, which is the same person. Do you know? Was it him? No, did he have uh bad hands? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm gonna have to Google that because that was my first thought. I'm like, from The Bachelor. I digress. Uh, <laughs> that's my girly side showing. <laughs> With these new 
additions to the team. We had 33 total new players added to the football roster. 17 were signed in the early signing period in December. Four came on signing day. 12 from the transfer portal. 18 of the 33 new additions are enrolled in the spring. Guys, how beneficial is it to be here now, being able to learn the playbook six, eight months before we really get going? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll kind of bypass the obvious answer as far as learning the playbook, strength and conditioning. I mean, that's all I've given, right? But I really want to focus on the relational aspect of enrolling early because yeah. – when you get there in the spring, there's kind of a mental aspect of it. It's a matter of respect that comes along with it. Now, whether guys mean to do this or if it's just a, a natural part of being a competitor, it's up for debate. But a lot of vets that have been with the program, they'll kind of keep the new guys at arm's distance for a little while. And you know they're kind of looking at them sideways like, who's this guy? And, you know, who's this fool think he is? So guys aren't welcomed in as part of the family immediately. It takes time for the new guys to acclimate to the program, put in the work with the rest of the guys before they're fully accepted. And it, it's really an uphill battle if you have to enroll in the fall because most of the guys on the team have already gone through that hell of winter, spring, summer workouts. And basically, you know, you kind of have to go through an off season to gain the respect from your teammates. So, I mean, I think that that's probably the the biggest benefit people don't think about whenever they enroll early. No, nah, no doubt. And it definitely helps whenever you can run a 4-3. <laughs> I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, you know anything about that. Could you four, run a 4-3? Absolutely <laughs> not. No. Fastest four, no, I, I could not run a 4-3. But I will say, I remember one year. So, you know, I go into Oklahoma State. I'm behind Parrish Cox, who ended up leading the nation in passes deflected. Uh, Terrence Anderson, T.A., was the other starting cornerback, and he was a senior, did his thing. And then you had Broderick Brown, who was going to be the senior uh, ne- the following season. And he's going into that season. He's going to be the starter. It's his job to lose. So now we, we had, have a whole. We had, uh, Mo Gray out there too. You had Mo Gray out there, but like we knew that Broderick would be the starter. Right? He was coming off an injury. And then that second spot was really up for grabs, right? It's anybody's spot. So here I am. It's like me. It's Andre May. You know, we feeling good. You got Mo Gray out there. Here comes this freshman in Devin Hedgepeth, <laughs> who was like Kansas player of the year. He comes in and almost immediately you're just like, oh, this guy is so technically sound that it makes no sense. Okay, so you're going through. He comes in and enrolls early in the spring, and he's getting a whole bunch of good looks, a whole bunch of reps. Cool. Summer workouts come about, and then you get a new set of guys that come in. One of them was Justin Gilbert. Okay, if y'all know anything about Justin Gilbert, he was one of the fastest people that I had ever seen run in person. Four three guy, uh, ran the fastest time at the combine whenever he actually left to go into the combine, and he was a guy who um, – got drafted top 10 overall to the Cleveland Browns. I remember his name. Yeah. Right. So you got Justin Gilbert coming in here. I am thinking that I have a chance after, (laughs) after TA and Peacock's leave and Jay Gill comes in showing off all his speed, just automatically. You're just like, yeah, this is just not fair. You know, I remember Jay Gill going up against Hubert Anyum and it was just so much speed on speed because Jay Gill was a four, three guy. Hubert was a four, four guy. And every time they went against each other at practice, you're just like, how is it possible that these humans can run this fast? And after practice, Jay Gill would challenge people to a race, like every single practice it seemed like, and he never got beat. So, and, and I think Isaiah Anderson was the other, like one of the fastest guys on the team until mm-hmm. out of nowhere, Justin Blackman became faster than Isaiah. Anderson and you're just like how did all this stuff happen anyway all that to say this Jay Gill comes in of course he became the starter but what a lot of people don't know and don't realize was that Devin Hedgepeth was actually starting over Jay Gill like Jay Gill may have been the better athlete but Hedge was definitely the better cornerback and it was so crazy um, because of his Achilles injury was so heartbreaking but everybody in that DB room just kind of knew hey Hedgepeth is going to be the real deal so whenever he tore his Achilles um, that really hurt that really hurt all of us but you know just a funny story how um, hey if you're going to consider enrolling later make sure you run a 4-3 yeah. <laughs> run fast That's, that is the moral of that story <laughs> moral of the story run fast yay 
Also, five of our new players are super seniors or red shirt seniors, however you want to. I mean, they also could have a COVID year. I'm not exactly sure how many of them are coming for their COVID year, but they are super seniors. So we will just run with that. What do you guys think that says about Oklahoma State that these guys want to come and play here for their last year of eligibility? Because if you look at some of the people who left Oklahoma State, they left because they want to improve their draft stock. But to come to Oklahoma State to do that, what do you make of that? Yeah, so I guess in the midst of a portal exodus like we've never seen before, here are five guys that want to spend their last year of eligibility at Oklahoma State. So, I mean, what does that say about OSU? Maybe it's not as bad as we've been led it to believe. I mean, who wants to spend their last year at a place where you're not going to be able to learn, grow, develop, cultivate relationships, and have fun winning? So, uh yeah, I guess that place is OSU, as it turns out. Yeah, I'll put it this way. The reason why I even went to Oklahoma State in the first place was because I uh, I wanted to be a sports media major. And OSU at the time, right, you're talking about 2008, they had one of only two sports media programs in the country. Now, after my freshman year, I ended up switching majors anyway. So I'm like, okay, why am I here? But by that point, I had already fallen in love with the university, with the people over there. The one thing that I can say about Oklahoma State that if feels like a family you know I, I like growing up i was just always like oklahoma like who would want to live in oklahoma but when once you're in, sorry justin no offense i know you love oklahoma but once you're in stillwater oklahoma you realize that it's the people like the people make all the difference there's a real family feel you know the city you know the university has got your back so i don't I'm not surprised by these super seniors deciding that they want to stay on campus that they want to stay at the university because it's easy to feel that love yeah, definitely. I mean, that's what, I mean, all my friends from Texas, they love to give me a hard time about it, but really that's what is, that's what makes Oklahoma great is the relationships, that family feeling. And, you know, if you're surrounded by those people, why would you want to leave? So all my friends left, I'm still here. And I'm, I'm basically like trying to spread that love to other people here in Oklahoma. So <laughs> come be friends with me. I don't know. We're waiting for you to move to Texas, Justin. Um, I'm in Oklahoma and you were in Stillwater two weeks ago and didn't even tell me. So, I mean, how, how much are you really trying to spread that love if you're not even telling me when you're Touché. in my Touché. town, but it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> my feelings weren't hurt. Hilarious. Oh, <laughs> Justin yeah. just got called out. He don't even know what to say right now. He's I don't, like, I really don't, uh, you know, just there for, <laughs> there for a basketball game, uh, <laughs> You said you were there for totally lunch. Forgot. What's your story? You're like, it was wow. a lunch well, trip. Which was it? Which was it? The prompt lunch trip or a basketball game? Can't be both because that was a seven o'clock game. What's the next part on the show? <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah, guys, the family is here is great. It's so great. They don't even call you when they're in town. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> kidding, kidding, kidding. I get it. I get it. I understand. I had a very busy day that day. Anyway, yeah, I me, like me too. Movies to watch or something. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure it was walking Dixby or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. it's, fine. it's totally fine. Uh, something that we have sort of talked about the last few weeks is the state of the offense and what we're going to see this year. Since now we know our coaching staff is our coaching staff is in place. Uh, Dunn is here to stay. But last a couple weeks ago, Justin, you sent us a tweet from Caden McFarland. And it was a list of Gundy's offenses ranked by yards per play. No surprise. Monk and your guy and your chitch are <laughs> one and two on the list. But Casey Dunn ranked 13, 14, and 17 out of 18. So there's that. How do we improve that season and move Coach Dunn up the ranks, guys? Well, yeah, it's uh... – just looking at that, just seeing that 12 out of the 18 seasons, so two-thirds of the time that Gundy's been the head coach, we've seen 5.9 yards per play or better. And that's that's about a half yard better than the average of all 131 Division I college football teams last year at 5.4 yards. Wow. And I tried to look back at the last season – a couple of different ways. I wanted to be fair about it. Uh, number one, I looked at the first seven games. So through the Texas game, 
before all the injuries happened. And uh, we got nine, let's see, 5.9 yards per play. So that's pretty good. All right. Uh, if you keep that average for the rest of the year, you're probably going to end up in the, in the rankings around 33 to 40 in that range. Uh, but I'll say this. I looked at the non-con versus the conference games. And if you just want to look at the conference games, Baylor, Texas Tech, TCU, and Texas, we were averaging 5.12 yards per play. So even with the healthier squad against our conference foes, not great. Not um, at all. So that tells me, I think our conference opponents have us figured out. Um, they know what to expect on first down to put us in second and long, third and long. Um, Justin, did you think that the play calling – was just kind of predictable over the course of the season. Like I, I, I know there was some times where I'm just like, why do we continue to run these halfback draws or quarterback sneaks in situations that are, you know, long yarder situations? I don't know. It, sometimes it felt predictable. What, what do you think it was? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I'm. That's what I'm alluding to. And in, in all honesty, it's kind of like uh, they've got they've got a full body of what Oklahoma State typically does, especially with Spencer Sanders being the quarterback and his. You know, fifth year at Oklahoma State, so we know what's, you know, fourth, fifth year, whatever, and uh, we know what to expect now. So it became very predictable. Meg, you asked, how do we improve? I mean, it, first of all, it starts with the offensive line and establishing a run game. Athletes need to make some plays, but for the OC, be a little more unpredictable. You know, be creative. Exploit weaknesses on the defense instead of just lining up and running up the gut on first and 10 or, you know, I don't know, just like, but whenever you do have success, for example, if you, um, maybe you beat a cover three with four verts, right? Keep doing that until they actually stop you. You know what I mean? Like, don't just stop because you've had success. Like keep doing that. Uh, and then maybe whenever they switch to quarters, that's when you hit them with the halfback draw Eve that you're talking about. Maybe that's whenever you hit them with some quick passes underneath, in those zones there, but you know, as far as you know, three years for Coach Dunn with arguably one of the most talented quarterbacks in Oklahoma State history, and we're not coming close to kind of what we've seen historically under Coach Gundy. Um, yeah, we we definitely need to improve. Um, yeah, yeah, it, it it does seem as though a lot of our explosive plays came whenever it was unscripted wasn't by design like the play fell apart and quarterback had to make something happen with his legs right was this interesting stat that i saw like deep ball completions highest completion percentage on balls 20 plus yards down the field with a minimum of 20 attempts yeah jason bean in kansas was first will howard and then max duggan at tcu was third you have to go all the way down to number 11 before you see spencer sanders name on there and you know granted you know that varies because of attempts and the injuries and everything. But then even further down, you got JT Daniels, Quinn Ewers, Donovan Smith, and then you see Garrett Wrangle's name again at the very bottom. So you're just like, man, what? where can we get some good designs down the field? Or oftentimes it seemed like whenever a player actually had the hot hand, you wouldn't stick with them. Like, I don't know, for whatever reason. I saw plenty of times where it seemed like Brennan Presley was about to go off and it would just stop looking his way or stop yeah. designing plays for him. And that stuff, that stuff just doesn't make sense to me. Um, and that's the stuff that, um, you know, I'd love to see g us get more creative with. And I think going into this season with an OC who was kind of on the hot seat, as many people, you know, kind of expect, you know, there were rumors this year about, hey, is Coach Arroyo going to come in as the offensive coordinator? Is he going to get fired? Is just being on the hot seat, I think, could be a good thing. It's just like being on a contract here in the NFL. It kind of forces people to do more and to get out of their comfort zone and to experiment a little more. So hopefully that's the case. And hopefully we start drawing some things up for players that actually have the hot hand during the game. Yeah, I wanted to point out a couple more things that I had on my notes. So one, in looking at the schedule, obviously the second half of the season completely fell apart with the injuries. But uh, 
if you look back, like for example, at 2021, it's like, whoa, the record was a lot better. What happened? Well, <laughs> we're we're seeing, especially if you hadn't figured it out already, the defense was the catalyst of, as far right. as why we won so many games because it's consistent. We've seen with yards per play, it's a very good indicator, especially in the Big 12, as far as how well your offense is doing. And our defense this year, um, not so much. Gave up eight yards per play to Kansas. My goodness. That's embarrassing. I mean, what are we doing, guys? Eight yards per play. I didn't I did not realize it was that yeah, bad. Wow. That's, that's not good. Not good. Uh we so I also looked at, you know, comparing some other teams. So Ohio State, I think they finished first. Uh they averaged seven points. Give us our defensive States. coordinator back, Ohio State. <laughs> uh TCU. All right. So best in the conference for the Big Twelve last year. They had eight point nine yards per play against OU. Eight point nine. Pretty impressive. OU? Eight point nine. Oh. Uh, well, they OU had really sucked. Now their two their two bad games were against Texas, which they still won, but they had three point nine yards per play, and against Georgia in the national championship, three point seven yards per play. So they overcame some of that, but uh, you know, against Iowa State, we love to talk about how great Iowa State's defense is in the Big Twelve. Uh, they held them to five point five yards, which is still pretty good. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so TCU, they've kind of, uh, they had a great year there. Um, I was also looking at, like I said, Ohio state 7.2 yards. Some of the, some of these offenses that you see these really high, you know, yards per play, it's like, golly, this is, you know, we, I wish we could be up here, but yeah, 7.4 with your 7.2 with Munkin and another one with Munkin at the top tied with Gundy actually, uh, seven yards per play so let's get back to that i'd love love to see some of that yeah yeah isn't it crazy how everybody just wanted to talk trash about your situation while you're <laughs> here and then you go and you actually look at the data and you're like dang these stats to, are maybe favorable yeah favorable. to be fair i think a lot of people right wrong or indifferent like that first year that he got here in uh 2014 they averaged 5.4 yards per play and it was 2014, right? That was the, a down year. We kind of got saved and the bailout punted again, Bob. Um, but since then, obviously, he took off. And uh, What was his... the biggest difference? I will point this out. The biggest difference between those coordinators and, and Casey Dunn. You talk about the arm talent with the quarterback. Okay? Like, you, you, you have probably the two most decorated passers in OSU history in uh, Brandon Whedon and then Mason Rudolph. Absolutely. And then, you know, as as talented as Spencer Sanders was, the arm talent wasn't quite there. We all know that when it comes to uh, the accuracy, especially. So, you know, it, it was a little up and down, right? There were, there were stretches of like four games where you'd be like, holy crap, where's this coming from? And then it would go away instantly. So yeah. I and think I to, to be more optimistic, to look on the upside, like yeah. with the people that we have on our roster right now, we, whether you're looking at Wrangle, where you're looking at Bowman, where you're looking at Zane Flores, these are people that have been um, kind of elevated because of their arm talent. So that's one thing that I'm really looking forward to was having a quarterback who who can sling that thing and, and, and can sling it accurately. I yeah, think and this I, season though, Spencer, you know, up until he got hurt, you know, you want to say, uh, we'll say up until Texas, T, like TCU, Texas, like, he was slinging the ball. He had like 400 mm. yards. And I mean, those, again, those are non-conference games. But I mean, I I truly believe he was in the Heisman conversation early on and then it derailed when he got hurt. But I mean, I think that Spencer mm. years, like his sophomore and junior year and his senior year are two different tale of two people. So I think it's kind of hard to compare because, yeah, the for early on, you know, in 2021, it's like, what are you doing? Like four picks in the Big 12 championship. Yeah, he had the interceptions problem. He, his his completion percentage was never anything spectacular. I like yeah, him a lot even too. his best season. Yeah, I mean, but at that I same point, you know, like this year a lot going going back to like uh, Mike Gundy in 2008, for example, he had seven yards per play. And 2008 was Zach Robinson at quarterback. Yeah. I think Zach Robinson is very similar to Spencer Sanders in that way. And with Mike Gundy as a head coach calling plays, and we're able to put up, you know, granted we had Des Bryant. You know, right. I was going to say, it also helps when you, <laughs> you have know. a Belinikoff finalist who can go yeah. out there and give you 22 receiving touchdowns. 
Yeah, that's what that's a lot of. But, yeah, we need to you know bring Des in and figure out what <laughs> what are we what are we missing, Des? Like, help us out here. Yeah. Well, again, time will tell. We'll see. We're you know a month and a half, a month ish out from spring ball, so we'll get to start seeing some of these guys in action. And college football ended a month ago, but guys, it's Super Bowl week. Rocking my Super Bowl gear, and although <laughs> there are no Cowboys playing in the Super Bowl, Oklahoma State or Dallas, um, not the point. <laughs> we are being represented by the playing field. The playing field in Super Bowl Fifty Seven, the turf was developed by OSU researchers. It is a special type of turf grass. It was also used in the AFC and NFC Championship. It is a type called Tahoma Thirty One was the base in Philly. The North Bridge was the base in Kansas City. For those who don't know, and I just learned this today, utility turf grasses are special types of grasses that can tolerate close mowing and traffic, and they can be used for lawns, golf courses, parks, uh, cemetery road, and they also knit together enough so that it can be cut and transported as what we call sod pads or sod rolls. So last week it was officially announced it would be in the Super Bowl. This playing surface is apparently incredible. It really helps the players' injuries. The way it's designed is so it can like kick up and like kind of go with you and move and stuff. So we were talking a little early in text. How how different is playing on turf versus sod or turf grass, which is an actual grass and not the astroturf? You know, for me. Uh... I, I really, truly, I like playing on any surface. All right. I grew up playing on asphalt. All right. I'm, I'm not. <laughs> so, and the grass fields that we had growing up were mostly dirt, but uh, from high school on, we're used to turf. I like turf a little bit more. I feel faster, less of a chance to slip. Uh, I don't have to worry about being itchy, right? Because I, I am allergic to grass, but uh, I, I prefer playing on turf. But Hearing stuff about the turf grass, like the stuff that Oklahoma State's developing, I, there's a lot of like cool science behind that. So I have a newfound appreciation for grass now. Yeah. And, you know, data shows that the majority of soft tissue injuries and even like ligament tears t- tend to take place on turf fields over grass fields. So I think anytime that you can protect the players, right, just from a safety standpoint with the grass, I think that definitely hurt. That definitely helps. Now, AstroTurf was one of the worst things to ever happen in football. I'm glad that it's pretty much extinct, right? I mean, you know, there's artificial um, grass. There's different types of turfs that are used now that I think that's te- the technology has allowed them for um, to feel a lot more synthetic um they feel a little more authentic uh authentically grass i would say but yo there's nothing like playing on grass and just make sure you take those allergy pills because (laughs) it can get crazy if you don't if you're sneezing out there the whole time i just think i mean it's one of my interns is currently working on a story that'll be out this week about the turf grass and the development of it and these things i mean this was developed 10 years ago it went through about six years of testing at practice fields and everything and then you know, manufacturers buy it and they they make the deals with the NFL. OSU is not making those deals with the NFL, but it's a really, it's still, I mean, it's OSU scientists who are making this and they're basically breeding two different types of grasses together to make the ideal playing surface that, you know, the, the difference of the one in Philly and the one in Kansas City are like, they're made for certain climates too. So that's why, you know, the, the one that we're seeing out in Arizona might be a little bit different because of the climate. So it's, I mean- yeah, it'll be more of a warm season grass, more more of Bermuda rather than like a Kentucky blue grass that you'd see in the Northeast or something like that. But yeah. they're also trying to like figure out how to how to make it durable in the cold weather so you can go into the Northeast because obviously right. Me right now in Oklahoma, my grass outside is brown because of the weather. So how can you make it so it can be sustained throughout? So got to blend in some over overseed with rye, you know, yeah. and then yeah, but. <laughs> The, the science uh, that goes hydration, into all of that is unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. A, a lot of the advancements that I've read about deal with um, just how they're able to retain water a lot better. Yes. Um, so it's it's good for the environment in that way. Yay, turf grass! But yeah, it's cool. I wanna I wanna like feel it and see because like my biggest my biggest thing was turf. So I I liked playing on turf. I also played field hockey. So you want the ball to be faster, and it's way better on turf. <laughs> 
duh. Yeah. Um, but th- also with lacrosse, I liked playing on turf because I don't, you know, you, you know, it's a flat surface. You you're not going to get any divots in the field, you know yeah. what to expect. And also like ground balls are a lot easier on turf than they are with potentially not even grass. Yeah. Uh, I digress. But the worst part of turf is the turf balls, no matter what. I always get those stupid little turf balls in my shoes. So but you know, you know what's funny, Megan? Even comparing, you know, field hockey or lacrosse to football, and comparing my experience in football compared to the, the what football is right now, this ain't the same kind of grass that we played on. <laughs> like, it's <laughs> weird. Like I go, I'm, I just think back to like 10, 12, 14 years ago, whenever I got to college, and the grass that we used to play on compared to you know whenever you step out on these fields now like you feel that grass you step on a grass you just like this ain't the same grass that we played with growing up you know it's it's just way different which is yeah i don't even know what to make of that it's a little my college field was super nice so i don't know i i, I did like that turf always left with the turf balls but no i yeah. remember like growing up playing soccer i would play indoor soccer too and that was literally like playing on carpet when you and you're like you fall <laughs> And you're like, this hurts. That's the AstroTurf I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah what, that, uh. it hurts so bad. And I was talking about my field hockey camp. You know, we, it'd be so hot that you would just kind of, and you'd be so sweaty because you'd be literally playing field hockey for 12 hours a day. I'm not exaggerating. And you would just slide across it because you're so hot and sweaty. And you're like, well, at least I'm not getting turf burn. But yeah, it's it's evolved. But yeah, yeah th- those maintenance teams, those maintenance groups do such an incredible job. It's it's very rare to even see like a grass pellet even out of place right now. Like <laughs> there's no unevenness across yeah. <laughs> across sports anymore. It's it's unbelievable. Shout out to the groundskeeping crews out there. Yes. I will say this though, like a lot of people will really overlook grass until they see something immaculate and then like, oh my gosh, like I I want my lawn to look like that. And you know, pretty soon your YouTube history is full of videos on how to make your lawn look better. And you know, the next thing you know, you're ordering New Balance 608s and tucking your t-shirt into your shorts. <laughs> So, uh, you know, shout out. It's a cool, it's a really cool niche to, to be a part of. So I don't, I don't know. I'm not speaking, speaking from, from experience, personal, but. personal experience right there. Hey, I will say though, if you, yeah, you ever go to Justin's house, his grass is supreme. Like my man takes care of his grass. Justin's about to order this to home a 31 <laughs> for his home. Dude, I've, I've looked in, I have looked into it. <laughs> Yo, you need to be one of those it's scientists expensive. who's out there. You need to. Grass. You need to talk to Kenny Bieski because he used to be a groundskeeper at that school that we shall not name. But he was he was yeah. like the director of turf management and groundskeeping. I remember like, hearing about that. Actually, you know, I I'm I'm good friends with one of our one of Oklahoma's experts in in that field, and uh, he's actually get him on the podcast. I'd love to. He's he's a great guy. He can he can tell us all about like the the ins and outs of this development that we've got. So I, I hit him up on text and he was you know spitting all these facts. And I was like, this is kind of in the weeds, no pun intended. Wow. Uh, but maybe we can get you on one day to talk about it. Yeah. Josh Campbell, shout out to Josh Campbell. <laughs> so here's the thing, even though there's no OK state cowboy that is in the Super Bowl, it's actually pretty crazy how many big 12 quarterbacks were in this, <laughs> this year's, playoffs right you had in the big 12 you had patrick mahomes brock purdy skylar thompson geno smith and jalen hurts you talk about five qbs from the big 12 conference and nobody else had more than two so it just goes to show how the game has shifted so much and you know the two qbs that are playing in the super bowl now are uh big 12 qbs you know in in the conference championship games three out of the four were big 12 qbs with the fourth one being uh, Joe Burrow, who was born in Ames, Iowa, by the way. So I guess that counts. We're going to go ahead and claim that three and a half, four by default. I don't know, but it's pretty cool. Um, and and I wish that more and more quarterback talent would see that and say, you know what? I'm going to go to Oklahoma State. Don't tell Bama fans that you're claiming Jalen Hurts to the Big 12 because they might they might fight you on that one. Hey, he That's left a- y'all for a reason, okay? Uh, that's the thing though like uh it wasn't the case for a long time like the the success for big 12 quarterbacks in the nfl is something very recent which i do like because that's the way that the game seems to be shifting in in the nfl a little more up tempo and slinging it like we've seen but that's why we need guys like you know spencer sanders i wish you would have stayed at oklahoma state and if you had success in the nfl 
that's that's the kind of stuff we need, like coming back to Oklahoma State. Because now what they're seeing is Patrick Mahomes. Oh, let me go to Texas Tech. Or they're seeing Jalen Hurts. Yeah. Let me go to OU, stuff like that. And I'm just like, oh, we need some Oklahoma State guys to represent for us. So <laughs> it was only four years ago, as short as four years ago, no starting QB from the Big 12 had ever won an NFL playoff game. Really? Yeah, four years ago. That's crazy. And now look, like it, the game has That's changed small. so fast. Oh. Tom Brady retired, so that helps. Did he? Did Ooh. he? He's not Tune starting his broadcasting career until 2024. So is he? <laughs> oh, I can just see it. I, I, I can see it. At some point next season, there's going to be a team that's six and one or five and two. Starting QB is going to go down, and Tom Brady's going to take that call and be like, "Yep, I'll come in. I'll I'll, I'll take y'all to the championship." So, Welcome back to New England with Bill O'Brien, but. Oh my gosh. <laughs> kidding, kidding, kidding. But guys, Super Bowl picks. I know it's not Oklahoma State, but Bixby is back. Picks with Bix. He picked the Eagles. Ooh. Go birds. Go birds. I I don't have a dog in this fight, but I'm also I'm picking the Eagles. I think that the Eagles look really good. And if they play like they played against the Giants, I don't even think this will be contest also i want to see jason kelly kelsey in a mummer's costume again and if you don't know what the mummers are look it up the kelsey bowl baby well one thing that i would say is take the over okay i'm pretty sure that the line right now was set at 50 and a half and mm. i just see this thing yeah i mean 25 to 25 20 27 to 24 you're already over that right so <clears throat> i would say take the over but it's so hard to root against michael jordan Okay, aka Patrick Mahomes. Like, it, 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 how do you root against? Like, I think it's very easy, Eve. It's crazy. I yeah, have it's, it's zero crazy, right? problems doing that. Anytime that you bet against Patrick Mahomes, he just proves you wrong. But also on the other end of it, you're just like, this Eagles roster has some of the most likable dudes ever. Between Jason Kelsey and Darius Slay, and then the head guy Jalen Hurts, and all these guys, are just like man, you, these guys you just want to hang out with. You just like you don't want a root against these guys. So even though I grew up a Dallas Cowboys fan, <laughs> it's really hard for me to even root against the Eagles. But oh. I got wow. I got the Chiefs winning it in a high scoring close game. Yeah, I mean, I'll say the Eagles really do look like the better overall team, but I'm gonna have to go with the Chiefs. I mean, we're talking about. We just talked about the creative play calling and Andy Reid. That's that's what I love, love, love about Andy Reid. It's one of the best in the NFL at being innovative. Everybody thought that the Chiefs were just going to be, you know, completely going to fall off without Tyree Kill, and they haven't missed a beat. It's unbelievable. So not I, only I, not only did they not miss a beat, but this dude Patrick. Mahomes went and he led the NFL in passing yards, led the NFL in passing touchdowns, and just did all so so. And he's gonna win the MVP. Like I lost my top target, and I'm gonna win the MVP. And it, it's the guy's unbelievable. He's unbelievable. I'm not even gonna get into this argument right now. Everyone's like, he still has other receivers, and like the rest of the offense is scrubs. But that's this is not. Yeah, he still has Juju Smith Schuster, guys. Well, he does have Kelsey. He has I'll Kelsey. Uh, he has Kelsey. But it is crazy. Like, you lost arguably the most talented receiver, and just the fact that he's still able to put up those numbers. Like, you got to give props, right? You got to hey, give props. You, you, you've heard me that. say it. I say it all the time. In a league full of freak athletes, Ooh. Oklahoma State. Tyreek Hill, the freakiest of the freaks. He's the freakiest of them all. That's right. It's crazy. Well, before we go, we will end quickly with some Oklahoma State shout outs, news and notes. First and foremost, I want to wish Avery Anderson, Avery Anderson, wow, a speedy recovery. He announced just the other day on social media, he'll be out indefinitely with a wrist injury. So speedy cover recovery to you, Avery Anderson. Wow. Cannot speak right now. Also, basketball. Congrats, Kayla Boone. Big 12 yes. players of the week. He's been... Bro. Falling on out. fire dude is like becoming one of my favorite basketball players right now i don't know anything about basketball so i'm not talking about it on here but boone keep doing what you're doing man i love it i just talked to him yesterday was yes yeah it was yesterday i'm like what day is it of the week i just interviewed him yesterday and he was awesome 
I'm just like, I'm a fan of yours because you're just like a really down to earth guy. And I just want to see you succeed. So keep balling, Caleb Boone. Keep doing your thing. Love to see it. Also, finally, the Chili Cowboy was earlier this week. For those who don't know, it's basically a polar plunge to raise money for Special Olympics, Oklahoma, and OSU's new unified team where you partner athletes with Special Olympics athletes into one big unified team. We just started that this year. This uh, Chili Cowboy, this is the second year. It was started by softball player Chelsea Alexander and first Cowboy Darren Trum. Guys, they raised over $50,000. Wow. Let's go. Okay. And OSU unified team. I found out today that a Malcolm Rodriguez jersey went for nine, a signed Rodriguez jersey went for over $9,000 in the auction on Saturday. And a field game day experience with Darren Trump went for the same thing. So they Mm -hmm. raised almost $20,000 for just those two items plus tons of donations. So, like, we talk about family, cowboy family. Perfect example, everyone coming together for a good cause. So there you go. shout out to those who took the plunge. Rob Glass was one of them. Bringing it full Come circle. On, coach. Glass had to do the cold tub? He, okay, now you know what it feels like. The dunk tank and they pulled the thing. I think I think Rashetti, Rashetti pulled the, the Come thing. Come on, big Shetty. <laughs> of course Rashetti did. Dunk him. And uh, he did it early, so Rob Glass is not expecting it. But, you mm-hmm. know, it's it, – that's what you get. Um, and it. yeah, so I mean, it was like 70 degrees outside, but they put ice in the tanks. So, and then uh, it was Brandon Presley, Braylon, Braden Johnson, Bryson, Braden Green, Green, one of the Green, Blaine Bryson Green. Green. No, Blaine, Blaine Green, the other one, Blaine Green. And then an O lineman who I'm sorry, I forgot your name, but they were out there representing Cowboy football and all the teams represented. And it was just like a really cool event. So, so dope. Seems like the beginning of something new, something good that's going to yeah. last um, for a while. So I hope so. And it's for a good cause. So you love to see it. Yeah. Cool. Well, that's all we got for this time. Sorry that we just rambled a lot, but we appreciate you <laughs> listening as always to this Believe in OK State podcast presented by Bet Online. Like, share, subscribe, comment. We'll set up our Manny Petty day because so many of you were intrigued by that. Also, lastly, I spoke to several people who supported my nine and three prediction for the season. So I was not alone in that. And I appreciate nice. those who supported my judgment or my decision last week. So, yeah. None of those people believe in OK State. So it's OK. Yeah, you know, 10, 10 wins is like the floor. 10 or more, floor. baby. That's it. Well, Regardless, we can all we gotta we we gotta do a better job. We need to step our game up. We gotta convince them, you know, that this is gonna happen. You gotta put my sales hat on. We'll get there. Well, guys, all that's left to say, go pokes. Go pokes. Go pokes.